Welcome to our November edition of First Wednesdays. Again, we're, I'm just ecstatic about the size of our crowd. Uh, we hope uh, for the rest of this semester and next semester we'll keep the good speakers coming. Uh, we'll have more announcements about some of that uh, later on in the, in the event tonight. My name is Jeff Hornsby. I'm the director of the Rainier Institute for Entrepreneurship and Innovation and the chair of the Global Department of Entrepreneurship and Innovation here at the Block School. And it's my privilege to welcome you here to one of our premier events, First Wednesdays. I want to welcome uh, our dean, Dave Donnelly. Thank him for coming. I want uh, to welcome all the Block faculty. Where are our Block faculty? Thank you for the great turnout. I want to welcome our mentors, the mentors in our eScholar program. Where are our mentors? Got a good amount of them? Yes, thank you. Our mentors volunteer endless hours to help early stage startups, whether they're students or people from the community, work on their ventures and succeed. And we're always grateful for their, their, their support and their time. I'm going to pass this over then to Ben Williams, the Assistant Director for the Rainier Institute and also the Director of our Enactus program to uh, carry on here and tell you what we're going to do today. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hornsby. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, it's fantastic that we have such a great crowd for uh, Mr. Barnett Hellsberg. Um, as new people come in, we still, I still see crowds outside, so they're going to keep on coming in. So if you've got some free seats next to you, um, either you know, scoot on in or, or let people by, um, because I think we're going to have standing room only here in a little bit. Um, first of all, uh, please save the date for our next First Wednesday in December, where we'll have our Rue Idea Jump Finals. So this is a competition of uh, UMKC students. Uh, the finalists will be pitching their ideas, and you can come check that out. That's December 7th. Um, if you're interested in participating in the Rue Idea Jump, the uh, submission deadline is November 18th. So you can check our website for more information. Uh, but please join us to, uh, to watch the finalists pitch and to take part in that. And as always, we'll have free pizza and drinks afterwards. Uh, November 10th, we have our Entrepreneur of the Year Gala. We are celebrating those who fearlessly create in Kansas City. Uh, this is our 31st annual Entrepreneur of the Year Awards Dinner, and we'll be honoring the Kirsnowski family, Ewing Kaufman, Gary Fish, and Joe and Judy Rately. Joe and Judy here today? They're not. Okay. Just checking. Uh, and as part of that, join us uh, Tuesday, November 8th at 10 a.m. right here in this room. The Regional Entrepreneur of the Year, Gary Fish, will be speaking uh, uh, right here um, at 10 a.m. So it's open to everybody. Please join if you are available. Um, it'll be really, uh, uh, Gary Fish has started a number of ventures, as you can see, as a current CEO and founder of Fish Tech Labs. So last month, we told you about the Student Entrepreneur of the Year uh, Award, which is part of our Entrepreneur of the Year Gala. I am proud and excited to announce this year's 2016 Student Entrepreneur of the Year, Tin Hove. Tin, stand up for us. Tin is a fantastic student that I've had the pleasure of working with uh, on a number of different projects. Um, he is a great example of a student that's really taking advantage of the resources available to students at UMKC and in Kansas City in general. Uh, he's taken part in multiple student groups. He's also started multiple student groups. He started his own business, which is going well. He's starting another business that he will be presenting at the Entrepreneur of the Year uh, Gala. And he also was on the winning team for the Rue Idea Jump last year. So congratulations again to, uh, to Tin. Uh, he will be accepting his award at the Entrepreneur of the Year uh, dinner. Um, so our eScholars program um, is a signature program here at the Rainier Institute for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. 
this has been a tremendous success supporting early stage ventures in Kansas City. I'd like to welcome Brian Boots up here to tell you a little bit more. Thanks, Brian. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming out. Um, so first off, I wanted to acknowledge a few people, a few very special people in the audience um, who work with the e-scholars in our program to help them start and grow their businesses. We have some of our mentors with us tonight. Uh, if you're a mentor, raise your hand, give a little wave. Thank you, thank you. And we also have a, uh, an additional subset of our mentor group here with us. We have a great uh, group of pro bono lawyers who work with the people in our eScholars program for free to help them uh, navigate a lot of complicated legal issues. So if you are a pro bono lawyer with us, uh, give a, another little wave. Well, thank you all for, for your support of our eScholars. So uh, if you're unfamiliar with the eScholars program, eScholars or Entrepreneurship Scholars is a program that helps people start new businesses. Um, we focus on early stage people, whether they're students or people from the community, with a two semester program of workshops, mentoring, and legal services. Uh, so the focus is that early stage person we focus um, not on any specific industry or technology, so if you have an idea for a software business, a product business, a service business, or a social venture, we'd love to be the place to help you start that business. Um, so we are accepting applications for the next cohort of eScholars. We take in a group each uh, September and each January. So if you are interested in participating in the program for the next group, um, check out our website. You can submit an application. If you have questions about what, how the application works, how the program works, I'm happy to set up a meeting with you and we can talk through that. And um, so with that, I'd like to introduce you to one of our graduates of the eScholars program. He came through the program uh, this past year and graduated in May, and he's also a student here at the Block School, finishing up his BBA. Uh, Eric Marquez with Rinvo. Hey guys, how's everyone doing? Uh, if you haven't signed up for the East Scholars, please do so. Um, I can't talk enough about them. Uh, it's been great, a lot of relationships. Uh, it's a great family to be a part of. Um, one of the things that I think I didn't know coming out of eScholars that would be helpful, going into the workforce, I think it made me more valuable. Um, <clears throat> when I sit in meetings with our shareholders at the place where I work, I just feel like I can answer questions for situations that come up a lot easier than if I wouldn't have gone. Um, <clears throat> some of you guys know me from Rapido's Mexican Delivery, and I am still working on that. Um, the team and I are working on a couple things, and I think we should be ready here in the next couple years. In the meantime, I've had a little side project called uh, Rinvo um, Inventory Manager. <clears throat> Basically, right now, my job is to train other managers. And one of the trainings that I have to do is inventory management. Um, it's a three-step process. I got to teach them <clears throat> what to count, how to count it. Then I got to teach them the usage formula, which um, for some people, that, that's OK. And then some people don't like math, so that's even more difficult. Um, and then I got to teach them how to put it into Excel, I, and that can get even more complicated with the fewer results. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I was looking for a way to make this a seamless process to teach, and I came up with it, an app that pretty much automates all the inventory uh, stuff that we normally do. Um, <clears throat> really, what I'm looking for to do is an easy to use, easy to teach inventory management software, and really. Once you get all the data in there, you can do so much with inventory. You can forecast your sales. You can um, do all, all sorts of great things. <clears throat> One thing that I ask from everyone is if you know of, of a small business owner that has the same issues that I do, I would love to talk to them. Uh, currently, right now, I'm in alpha stage. Uh, we will be rolling out our beta pretty soon. Um, I would like to see if this translates to other businesses. If it's a restaurant, I would love to get them in the beta. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking for a cheap, low-cost alternative to what's out in the market right now. I've been to the Restaurant uh, Association um, conference in Chicago last year, and I literally talked to every single booth looking for a solution for my problem. And what I found was there are some out there, but it's a bolt-on. Right? I have to buy this other piece of software in order to get what I really need is inventory. Um, on top of that, the very own people selling me this couldn't figure out how to use it. We spent five minutes and they couldn't even get me through the first process of counting inventory. Uh, with my app, it's literally two buttons away. 
you, you select what you want, you count the inventory, makes the order for you, hit submit, and you move on. Um, <clears throat> again, my name is Eric Marquez, there's my email. If you do come up with somebody maybe later on down the line, uh, Brian's a great resource. Uh, if you contact him, he'll contact me, and I'd, I'd love to talk to some more people about this. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. So what, uh, what one piece of advice might you give to uh, some of your peers sitting in the audience who might be thinking about starting their business or who has an idea uh, for a business through they've identified a problem in their daily working lives or in their, um, in their home lives, kind of like you did? What would be your, your number one piece of advice for that first step? Um, this is going to be my third venture. I've had two failures in the past. I'd say take your first step. Uh, the answers are out in the world, not in an office or in a classroom. You got to get out there. You have to go out there and, and take that first step. Once you do, it's a great journey. And I can't talk enough about it. Uh, my dad's a business owner. And I can't, being a business owner is something different than no, no employer can ever give you. Uh, just something that, that is special that only a business owner understands about having your own business. Thank you very much, Eric. I'm going to pass it back over to Ben Williams now. All right. Thank you so much. And once again, if you're interested in e-scholars or know someone that is, contact Brian Boots. His information is, is up on the screen here. Or if you're interested in being a mentor for the program, uh, Philip Goncher is your man to talk to. He, he uh, manages our mentor program. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce... Uh, the Dean of the Block School of Management, Mr. or Dr. Excuse me, Dr. Dave Donnelly. I am also Mr., so that's fine. <clears throat> I will promise you at home, nobody calls me doctor. And uh, so I, I appreciate the uh, chance to, to be here today. First off, let me tell you good afternoon and welcome to First Wednesdays. Um, this is truly one of our exciting programs at the Block School because it's really designed for the students. It's a program that allows you to be introduced to and hear from some of the leading entrepreneurs in the area. And it always, every time we uh, have a speaker on First Wednesdays, I know myself, I leave going Boy, that was great. I'm glad I was here. There, there's Everybody can learn from the experiences of the individuals that present here. It's truly my pleasure and honor to introduce today's speaker. He's a native Kansas Cityan. He's also definitely one of Kansas City's most iconic entrepreneurs. It's Barnett Hellsberg, Jr. Barnett is the former chairman of, Hellsberg, of, uh, chairman of the board of Hellsberg Diamonds, where he expanded the company from 15 stores in 1962 into the third largest re jewelry retailer in 23 states. He then sold the company to Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett in 1995, and that got a lot of attention in Kansas City. Burnett received his biz Bachelor of Business Administration from the University of Michigan. He is the creator of I, the I Am Love theme, and has authored three books, and you'll see books uh, sitting uh, at, your, at your seat. He co-wrote I Am Loved with Dr. Rich Davis, the founder of Ma uh, Masterpiece Barbecue. In addition, he authored the book What I Learned Before I Sold to Warren Buffett, and he co-authored Entrepreneurs Plus Mentors Equals Success, 22 Convincing Stories. All of these are outstanding reads, and I would encourage you to look in and to, uh, you have one in front of you, but look into all three. They're very, uh, they're very good reads, and you can take a lot from those. Barnett is currently the chairman and founder of the Hellsberg Entrepreneurial Mentoring Program and co-founder and board member of the University Academy K-12 Chartered Schools in Kansas City, Missouri. He established the Hellsberg Leadership Fellows, a program to train young Jewish leadership, and has been an adjunct professor at Rockhurst University for more than 17 years. Barnett was inducted into the Entrepreneurial Hall of Fame in 2014 as a member of our inaugural class. He is married to Shirley Bush Hellsberg, an entrepreneur in her own right, and also a member of the Entrepreneurial Hall of Fame inaugural class of inductees. 
Barnett and Shirley have two adult sons, Barnett the third and Bush, six grandsons, and I was told they're brilliant, and one granddaughter that I was told is not only brilliant, but gorgeous, so you're very fortunate. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm block school welcome to Barnett Hellsberg. Well, I got an interesting assignment from uh, Beverly Stewart. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not an engineer. Any engineers here? We may need to. Anyway, uh, my assignment was the secrets of success of Hellsberg Diamonds. Well, I'm going to give you something much more valuable. Uh, and I don't think this has to be off the record. <clears throat> and I was interviewed, and they said, uh, for one of Henry Block's awards, and they said, why was Henry Block so successful? And I said, that's easy, he married a Hellsberg. <laughs> so uh, there are really no secrets. And I'm going to talk to you about not just things I did right, things I did wrong. Unfortunately, <laughs> I wish I'd been a mentee in our program. I've learned so much from these people. And please, I grade myself on the questions, so just hold your hand up if a question hits you, please. Uh, we got about 45 minutes, so I hope you'll, I'm gonna need a lot of questions. <clears throat> anyway, uh, so I'm gonna tell you what I've learned from mentees and so on, and it was kind of confirmed in a book I've been reading called Originals. Because some of you all want to be entrepreneurs. Well, you're going to be hiring people. That's the most critical thing in the world. When you're right, it's a home run. When you're wrong, it's a disaster. And the old saying is, hire slowly and fire quickly. And Jim Collins, maybe you've read his book, uh, I heard him speak and he said, nobody wants to fire, it's horrible. But the truth is, when you don't, you're cheating those people, you're taking their lives because they're gonna go out and have a longer time with another company. So you're not helping them at all. <clears throat> it's very painful for you as well as them, but it's not the right thing to do if there's not a fit. And I want to use the word fit. Uh, a lot of you know Danny O'Neill. I really heard that word from him. And then it was reconfirmed in this book I mentioned. Uh, the book talks about three, and I've done this very wrongly in a couple of cases. So this is not stuff, oh, he did everything right, he made a dollar. That's not true. Uh, as my dad said, nobody's smart all over. I guess I'm a good example. But anyway, uh, this book talks about why do you hire this person? Experience, background, uh, track record. And this book says start with fit. One of the greatest mistakes I ever made was doing not hiring for fit. Today, and like you all, I mean, I work with a lot of entrepreneurial companies, obviously, in the Hellsberg Entrepreneurial Mentoring Program. Uh, did any of you see Steve Wozniak? We had him uh, as our speaker last fall. But anyway, uh, fit, culture, and I see it in these companies. And so Beverly says, well, what would you do different differently, there might be an English teacher in the room. Uh, well, honestly, when I see these cultures in these small companies, and I know you all want to be entrepreneurs and start your companies, 
and that's incredible. Uh, I have a lot of respect for that. Uh, you know, these publications mess things up sometimes. So one of them quotes me and says, I started the company. Well, I had to explain to him, I am not 101 years old. I did not start the company. But anyway, uh, you all are talking and thinking and dreaming about that. Uh, that's great. And you, once, when you make that first hire, or second, or any of them, just think about fit. I didn't really know that. Nobody ever said that to me. Now, let me warn you. Somebody's going to come up in a year and say, boy, you were great. I heard you. I heard you. And I'm going to say, well, what do you remember? What would you learn? Just one thing. It's all I ask that you learn. But if you can think of that, think of fit. Uh, culture, it's... I know it's a trendy word, but boy, it is really true. Uh, what would I go back and change? Well, anybody been to Rainy Day Books in Fairway? Has anybody ever been there? Uh, Vivian Jennings uh, started it, and it's a great bookstore. I mean, it's the old-fashioned bookstore. They've read the books, they know about them, and uh, she had to fight her way in, fight her way to get a lease. Then she's got, she's a bookstore. She's got Amazon. At that time, she had Borders, Barnes & Noble, you name it. And so here's what Vivian taught me, a little too late maybe. Bigger isn't better. Better is better. So whatever you do, keep your quality. It really pays off. And, you know, a lot of people get scared about pricing. And I learned from one of our contractors, also from my dad for sure. Uh, one of our contractors told me, he says, now I want you to know I'm not going to be the low bidder. Our diamonds were higher than anybody. At that time, we sold only certified perfect diamonds. We were higher than anybody. I don't know how. My dad dominated every market, but uh, how do you do that? Well, somebody, this one customer said, you're high priced. I said, you're absolutely right. If you want the cheapest, we're the wrong place. You have to keep in mind with your business that you're starting. You can't be everything to everybody. You can't be the price guy and the service guy and the quality guy, you can pick two out of three. And some people tell their customers that, pick two out of three. I'm not the cheap guy. I'll give you quality and service, or I'll give you price and no service. And some people want that. But uh, two out of three. So I think you have to be very candid with your customer, very forthcoming. Uh, call it honest, whatever you want to call it, and uh, it pays off. It'll pay off. Uh, I talked to a man the other night. He started an advertising agency. Nice man. He's retired. And this is unbelievable with what's going on today in the TV. When they started this agency, they agreed they would not do any political advertising. Can you imagine? <laughs> you turn on your TV, that's all you hear. So it's tremendous money. But they had a principle, and they were successful. So uh, I think, you know, my dad, you know, he said, just take care of the customer. If they cheat you, they'll tell everybody. Well, I think the payoff wasn't really with the customers. I think it was with the people that worked in our company. Because you want that loyalty, and I always say, you know, that, that makes the pride of your company. Uh, my folks had this saying, if they'll steal for you, they'll steal from you. So if you expect your people to be dishonest, and there are those businesses, uh, 
you can expect them to be dishonest with you. And also, they're not going to be in love with your company. I mean, we've had people there over 50 years. Uh, I think this lady outdid my dad. Uh, her name's Marilyn Weiber. And uh, she had her 50th anniversary. I go in the, you know, we had sold out, but I visited the company. And there she is. I said, Marilyn, what are you doing here? She's still working. So, you know, you want to build with your, the people you want to sell are the people that are on your team. They're the key to everything. Uh, what advice would I give young entrepreneurs? Well, let me tell you about a, a problem we had and what happened. And a erroneous decision we made. So we're in these downtown stores and they're going like this. And oh, it was horrible. I mean, you know, Christmas, uh, that Saturday before Christmas is 2% of a year. If there's an ice storm, you just bought the farm. Forget it. It's horrible. So it's a scary business, but uh, you know, I loved it. You're looking at beauty. People want to, they're in love, they're happy. It's a happy business. It's not like, I don't want to offend anybody, but it's, you know, I need a new gutter. Well, I'm not in love with gutters. That's okay, but you know, uh, these people want to be there. But anyway, uh, it's a very, it's a happy business. And one of my dad's lesson was, if you don't, love what you're doing, don't do it. And nobody wanted his kids in the business more than my dad, but he taught us that. And uh, of course, we had a lot of fun. Uh, now, I want to tell you kind of a negative, or a story, that's a bad word. Uh, and I need some questions. Any questions so far? And you got to talk up because you're speaking to the deaf. I may have to have somebody come up here and... Insert. Luckily, we got a mic, too. So oh, good. Thank you. Barnett, could you just give everyone a little bit of a sense of, of your business and how it grew? Some of the folks in the room are not as familiar. Yeah, I'm gonna so if you could talk exactly about that. And definitely, if you could share the story about the I Am Loved button. Yeah. Okay, how do we grow? Well, the first thing we did was make a tremendous mistake. We're going downhill in these downtown stores. You know, my dad always said, get a corner. In fact, uh, when our, my brother sent me a thing with all these cemetery plots, he says, join the crew. You know, he's, he and his girlfriend have picked out. So I said, no, I'm following dad's advice. I'm getting a corner. I'll do more business than you. But anyway, uh, what happened? So we're going this way. Our competitors go into licensed departments in discount stores. We do the same thing. Kmart, Woolco, Jim, I'm sure you never heard of these, most of them. Uh, Trademark, horrible business. And uh, yeah, some of them did well. Detroit, we did well. But you know, it, it's, you're not controlling your destiny, you're not the guy. So we finally caught, we didn't catch on to shopping centers, unbelievable. Well, we finally did, great. We get out of the licensed departments, some of the luckiest things in the world, I gotta tell you an incredible story about my luck. So when you close a store, you got the merchandise. You got all this inventory. You got a lot of dollars. And how are you going to get rid of it? And you see the going out of business sales. They call them GOBs. Uh, well, let me tell you what happened. This was in the license department only. Departments. Incredible. This guy came to us from Portland, Oregon. It was called Miller International. And he says, I want to put on all your diamonds in all the licensed departments and just pay me when you sell them. Memorandum. Well, we closed 15 departments, I think. And he got the merchandise back. We didn't have the problem. 
and we were really lucky. We sold all but maybe the last two. In fact, my brother goes down to Zales, and somebody said, Charlie Hillsburg's here to sell us another lousy store, and he, they always bought it. So anyway, it was great. So anyway, now we're going to go into shopping centers, and we go to these, uh, I call it a shopping center, shopping centers, the International Conference of Shopping Centers. They have a, every year they have a big deal where all these developers have a booth, and you go in, what are you developing, what, you know, and they pull out all these plans, and here's a space, or here's a space, or, but it wasn't here's a space. Here's what it was. We really don't need you. We had, Zell takes two stores. Gordon takes two stores. These guys, these developers would walk out, let's say they'd have a, uh, a lease for, in those days, oh, whatever it was, 50 grand, a half a million dollar. They go to the bank, they get half a million dollars. They would walk out with cash. They would overfinance these things. And we don't need you. And those guys were loyal to them. They were helping them build the centers. They went in every center. So who are you? I never heard of your company. We don't need you. We got these two guys and they give us four stores, and it made sense. And I said, well, I hope someday we can earn your loyalty. I think that's great. <clears throat> so how'd we do it? Well, here's how we did it. And somebody mentioned Ron Atchison. Who was that? Anyway, we had fantastic people. Ron was a major part of this. And what we did, we ended up, at that point, being about double the competitors' volumes in the same square feet. Well, if you're doing a million dollars and paying 5%, don't ever do a percentage rent, by the way. Let me give you that. Remember that one, please. Uh, anyway, uh, if you're doing a million, it's 50 grand. If Zale's doing 500, that's 25 grand. All of a sudden, you're a good looking guy. I'm going to talk to you. So we, and I remember this guy, he was being really nasty, but it was absolutely true. And he was drunk. It was at one of these conventions, and he walks, he's in the lobby, and we come in, and he says, and you know, we're teeny, we're both five stores a year or something. These guys, he says, cherry pickers. Well, that was absolutely right. And we were picking creamy locations. And uh, obviously, a lot of them did very, very well. Uh, so that's how we finally started to grow. And, uh, you know, we got the credibility and good things happened. Uh, but boy, it was interesting. Where we were starting, I'll never forget. Uh, the guy was with the Bartolo, who was a, was a giant landlord. And in front of all the, I go to the suite. At those, that time, they had suites. That was miserable. It was Toronto, and I remember it cost me $18 to go out to this hotel. Never got over it, and nothing happened from it. So I resented it. But anyway, uh, and this guy chews me out because David Rose from Detroit had given him a big selling. He was going to do a big job, but I guess he didn't. And so he chewed me out in front of all these people. And in uh, fact, years later, I had somebody tell me they were in the room. I mean, it was uncalled for. But anyway, I didn't say anything, you know. Uh, anyway, so time marched on. We were able to grow and had a great reputation. And uh, let me tell you what we did, though, on productivity. And believe me, Mr. Kaufman had this, if you don't produce, you know, they talk about his principles, that you're great. You know, you share in the benefits if you're contributing. But a very smart lady who worked there, she said, 
And you know, you're out if you don't. Well, let me tell you what we did. It was very exacting. Uh, every Monday morning, we reviewed every person's sales. And you know, this is the advantage of not being too big. But they could do it on a divisional level today. I think they do. And we'd say, OK, uh, you need to have Beverly. Beverly's, what's her hourly sales for the last week and the month to date? Well, if month after month she isn't doing it, we based it on the salary some multiplier. And if they weren't cutting it, they were gone. They weren't going to move up. They weren't going to have an opportunity. Now, that's the bold facts. Maybe that's not pleasant. I remember this lady, my wife has a thing called Webster House, and I almost had a stroke. This lady says, well, I wouldn't want to work anywhere where they followed your sales. Well, hell, that's all I am about. <laughs> that's all my dad taught us. So uh, anyway, uh, it worked. But you have to be, I always say, love them in the AM, love them in the PM. And Mr. Kaufman kind of inspired this mentoring program we've got, 21 years old. But uh, you know, he taught me, you know, you sent him gifts. I would top 10 salespeople, sent them a little Mercedes model. Of course, I wrote a letter and it said, we're the only jeweler in the world that gives Mercedes to their top salespeople. <laughs> it's incredible. And, you know, I had so much fun doing that. But there's just not enough you can do for the right people and uh, appreciate them and enjoy them. And, I mean, it was fun. It was fun. And of course, you know, I've got a kind of a wise guy sense of humor. I remember this lady told me she's leaving the company. And I said, why? She says, well, my husband is in the military and he's being transferred. So I said, you mean your husband is more important than this company? I don't get this. <laughs> Gave her the devil. But we had a lot of laughs, a lot of fun, and uh, a lot of incredible people. And you know, in this business, the, well, I had, I have lunch with each new mentee. And I had lunch with a, one of this guy in a very high tech business this week. And he, he's got a lot of clients in California, or maybe five, I don't know how many. And he doesn't just thank them. He goes out and visits them, eyeball to eyeball. Well, these people, boy, I really appreciate this. And there's three magic questions if you have a customer. Let's say you're in a business where, well, you have a lot of customers or a few. Here's the questions. I learned it from a lady from the Kauffman Foundation. A lot of people give me credit, but that's fine. Uh, so Mary McMahon, she came over to my class at Rockhurst, and I said, she was talking public speaking. So I said, Mary, these students, they can't get a good review. How do you get a good review? I had my timer set, but would you know where we are on time? Somebody have about 15 minutes. 15, okay. Uh, how do you get a good review? And I love these questions. You can use them with a customer. I have not used them with my wife. But here's what they are. What am I doing you like? What am I doing you don't like? What am I not doing you would like? Now, if you go to a customer and say that and shut up, be quiet, get them to talk, always try to get the other guy to talk more than you. You're going to find some things out. You're going to build a relationship. Uh, I call them magic questions. So uh, uh, have you done that? The Nelson. <laughs> and, but you know, you may not hear what you want to hear, but maybe you get the truth. 
uh, I'm a little on edge when my wife's here, but I, so we talked about her being here, and I, I said, I want you there, I don't. I love it because she's honest with me. You know, everybody, oh, it was great, great, great. And uh, Karen is supposed to be honest with me today. But I, then I told her, you know, I'm a little on edge with you there, so she's not here. But anyway, she's a tremendous entrepreneur. Uh, she's the head of the Nelson, was the head of the symphony for 18 years, developing property downtown. These women, I'll tell you, I'm a one-trick pony. I don't know how they do it, but they do it. And uh, I, it's, you know, it's uncanny. Uh, anyway, those are some of the principles, but I need some questions. Can I, can I ask one question? Um, this book is what I learned before I sold to Warren. This is 20 years ago that you sold to Warren. How has the business changed? And I know that you're still involved or you look closely to Hellsberg Diamonds. How has the business evolved and what do you think you would need to do today if you still were the head of the business? How has it changed? In the last 20 years. And what would I do today? Mm. Well, number one, I'm a dinosaur. Number, two, It's been 21 years. Number two, I'm not around it that much. I'll tell you one place that's dramatically changed. In my day, De Beers controlled 90% of the diamonds in the world, which meant they did generic advertising, they did all kinds of stuff, uh, they would help dealers, and I mean, they had a lady uh, traveling the country, Gladys Babson Hannaford giving speeches about diamonds, because if you bought a diamond, it was theirs. Well, today, uh, I mean, frankly, they would buy in those days, I'm sure, from smugglers, anybody to keep. Uh, today, it's, there's mining in Australia, I think in Canada. It's a whole different world. So that's a big change. The other change, and frankly, it had to have something to do with our getting out of business, which I have mixed feelings about. I have two sons. One or both of them would have been here. But uh, I saw the monopolization of these landlords, and I knew, you know, you don't make money in 100 stores. You make money in six stores. You do a couple that do six million. Well, we start my... Sometimes your memory's too good. I mean, it started out with $15,000 leases. Okay, they're way higher by the time I left. I don't remember, 50 grand, maybe a hundred. But it goes against the percentage, whichever's more. Well, you're doing $6 million, and the landlord wants a $300,000 minimum. The risk-reward ratio is changed. It's kind of like my skiing. I love to ski. I've been hurt. I heal quickly. And I always tell my wife, next time I'll quit. I never do. But now I'm skiing and I'm starting to think about the risk-reward ratio. I'm a little older. So uh, I saw that as something I did not see, I will tell you. I had no idea. Basically, the retail business has turned upside down. Uh, Nordstrom's laying off people. Macy's laying off people. You got Amazon. We bought, we would pay for the most expensive spot in the mall, traffic. Well, visits are less. The length, time of the visits are less. It's a whole different world. So, I need some questions. All right, we got a question here. And as yeah, you are listening to the answer, if you've got another question. Some students, we want no more of these we've, we've stooges got, from the <laughs> Nelson here. I'll, I'll come down to you next, all right? I'm going to start right here with Megan. Okay, um, something I've learned, at least in my classes, about being an entrepreneur is it's kind of hard to know when you've got a good one and when you've got a bad business. And you talked a little bit about having... Uh, some failures or some turbulence in the beginning, how did you know to stick with it? 
Ooh, well, let me give you another honest confession. I had a great idea. I'm, I'm, I'm reading all this stuff. The post office says there's billions people are paying in phony billings, you know, yellow pages, blah, 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 blah. So I go to one of our hampers, Dave Cassiope. I said, got this idea, will you be my partner? Okay. So <laughs> we develop this software and we go to the state, we go to the city, we run their, and basically we prove they don't need us. A great idea. It's like asking your mother, is this a good idea? I don't know when you quit. And you know, Henry Block, and you probably know, I mean, they walked down Maine to get business for eight years before they hit it. So I don't, that's a really tough one. But I finally caught on that this wasn't gonna work. And let me tell you one of the problems, negatives, and we're, we do a, one of our meetings at Hemp is gonna be, we I have two slogans. One is worst foot forward, and the other is absolute confidentiality. So you can tell your men or anything, and you know, and I haven't heard of a breach in 21 years. But anyway, uh, and this, this may really help you. What I read about these businesses, the secret, not having money. I just kept pouring money in. And, uh, you know, if I hadn't been able to do that, maybe we'd have sought another way. But, you know, we had three deals. We'll send you phony bills. You sign up for them. And you uh, will go through, we got this, database, we'll see if you paid any of these guys. And we had a deal with QuickBooks, but nothing worked, I finally caught on. And I told Dave the other day, I said, you know, we were just showing these people why they didn't need us. But you know, the, the other wrong thing about it, I don't like a business that's one and done. They would have just tightened up and said, we don't need you. You know, we wanted to get a get a continuing stream of revenue. So I don't know how you know. Henry Block, eight years, they walked the street. All right, we got the next question right here. My question is, on your list, number three is smart is dumb, dumb is smart. I'm curious in knowing what you mean by that and how that played into how you ran your business. Can you repeat that? Um, sorry. No, he can repeat it. Oh, okay. Uh, so to be no, honest, my hearing is like this and here, yeah. and this is women's voices. So I said, <laughs> I said to the guy, I can't hear women. He says, yeah, that makes sense. Well, it's a great thing with my wife. I just, you know, I can't hear. <laughs> I never knew I was supposed to pick up milk. You didn't tell me the groceries. Uh, Not a bad thing. So the question is about number three here. Smart is dumb and oh, dumb is smart. Oh, I love smart. that one. Thank you. That is really a good one, and uh, it's from some guy that wrote a book about negotiating. I'm the worst negotiator in the world. Nobody believes that, but because our business was successful, but I am. Uh, what does that mean? It means, and I didn't know this as a when I was young. And you know, you want to look how smart you are. That's not really the way to get ahead. The way is. Being smart is dumb. If I'm showing you, oh, I know everything, I know what you're talking about, blah, 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 I don't need to buy this, or I do. Dumb is smart. You listen, you don't act like you know everything, you open up and listen. And uh, uh, yeah, I really like that one. I stole almost everything there, but. That's one I like a lot. All right, so just here in the front. All right, so every entrepreneur has the same problems I've seen all over. So in the beginning, they face some struggles, problems, difficulties, but something make them overcome that. What was this moment for you? What make you overcome your problems? Well, you just so don't give up. I'll give you an example. We always thought way ahead. I'm sure you've been taught that. I'll give you an example. We send the, ch you know, these suppliers, they want to load you up. 
just pay us in January. That's when you got a lot of money. Well, we mailed out the checks on the 10th of January. We had great credit. But we needed $500,000, so we go to the bank. I got a letter. It says, you can have $500,000. Of course, I didn't read the last paragraph. And the b bank says, no dice. That would have wrecked our company. Well, here's another hint for you. My dad had been doing business with a bank in Kansas City, Kansas, run by the Bridenthal family. And boy, I was, you can imagine, we were sick. So we drive over to Kansas City, Kansas. Morris Bradenthal Jr. said, well, how much do you want? So my lesson was have two suppliers for everything. I even wonder, I don't know which one was on strike, but, you know, UPS and <coughs> uh, FedEx. I wondered what happened to the people that only used one of them when the other one went on strike. You know, there's a great African saying, and that is, only a fool puts both feet in the water to test the depth. <laughs> so you, you got to know. And, you know, you think, oh, I got a great relationship. I love him. Well, the guy's brother-in-law buys the company or takes over, and he, he's got the same business as you somewhere, or he doesn't like the... Will you look or something? Uh, who knows? So I'm sorry, but you got to be, I'm basically very naive and cynical, or not cynical, I'm more cynical now. But uh, when I was with one of my mentees, <laughs> he says, and he's got a great business, but it's small. He's doing everything. And that's what we love to get them when they need to start delegate. And he says, I don't trust anybody and I have to do everything myself. Well, I said, well, you're the perfect guy. You're the guy we need. We want to take people and help them grow to that next level. But uh, it's a sensitive area. So in one of the lessons you learned, you said uh, cash flow is key, not profit. So right. what do you mean by yeah, that? Yeah, and I may be nuts on this. I'd like to hear from the... Uh, business school people. Uh, and I was criticized when I said this to our company. But I'll give you an example. We got a great lady in hemp. We call it hemp. I have to tell you a story about that, but I won't get off the subject right now. Anyway, she's in trucking. She puts truckloads together. You call her and say, Melody, I want this stuff to go to Chicago and blah, blah. Anyway, she puts these together. So she goes to a hemp meeting in this CPA talks, and she goes to him after. She's paying taxes. She's making money. Guess what? She starts buying trucks. And at, I don't know current rules, but at that time, you could charge it off in a year. You know, usually you amortize over five years, 10 years. So you buy, I don't know what these trucks cost, probably 100 grand. So you save the taxes and you've got the cash. So to me, the job in your business is creating cash, not profit. Now, let me give you the other side. We got a fantastic lady in the same exact business, very successful. And I asked her if she did that. She says, no, we don't believe in doing it. We'll pay our taxes. So. It's different strokes for different folks. There's not one right way, you know. So, uh, but that's what I I like. I think cash is a very good thing because you pay your people, you pay your suppliers. I um, hope you can save enough to sit on some and have a reserve fund. Some of our real smart entrepreneurs take a small percentage and put it in a rainy day fund. Because you're going to have a disaster. And failure is part of your success. You're going to have failures. You're going to have disasters, like we did in the license department, trying to get into the malls when the guy wouldn't loan us the money. The checks are all going to bounce. So 
you're going to have the disaster. Failure is a part of your success. So I'm sorry, but I'm promising you uh, that this happens. It's part of life. All right, that I think we've right got here. time for two more questions, evidently. Um, my question is, when an entrepreneur is starting out, prices are always the first thing that always comes to mind that they struggle with. Since you're such an exclusive brand, how did you guys decide on your price factor? How did I decide on? The prices for your diamonds. Oh, the what? The prices. I can't understand when. How'd you develop price? your pricing strategy? Your pricing strategy. Oh, pricing. Uh, we, you know, we were high quality, we were high priced, and uh, we want, you know, we wanted to be able to give uh, the service, and when you came back, we wanted to be able to take care of you. It's really important, and I'm glad you brought that up because most of us, and I'm sure I was there sometimes before I learned, you know, we're scared of pricing. Oh my God, oh my God. And somebody says, well, do you know, I couldn't believe it, here's my memory. You probably don't even know this company. They said, do you know Montgomery Ward's diamonds? And I said, no, I have no idea. Well, you don't know your competitors, and a knock is a boost. If you knock your competitor, that's the dumbest thing you can do. That's a boost. And you don't know. You don't even know. So you're better to say the truth, which is, I don't know. I have enough problem understanding our own diamonds. <laughs> I don't know anybody else's. So uh, that, that's a very good question. And again, I go back to the contractor that taught me within the last week or two. I'm not going to be your low bidder. I want you to know it. We never tried to be the low price guy. You know, you can't be everything to everybody. You know, price service quality, pick two. I can't give you all three, pick two. And that's what my dad did, yeah. which was really fun and gave a lot of pride to our associates as well as making the customers happy. And my dad had a saying, he said, quality is remembered long after price is forgotten. That's for sure. All right, so we've got our last question over here. Hi. Uh, okay, so I think I read in Buffetology that uh, um, when you made the deal to sell Hellsbury Diamonds, you sold it partially in stock, uh, BRKA. Uh, so I was wondering how you negotiated that deal, because I think at the time it was like 76000 per share, and he was really like trying to you know, not sell that. How did we engineer the deal? Yeah, how did you do that? Well... That's the easiest story in the world. Well, in those days, uh, this is, I don't know if you know it, but this is before Al Gore invented the internet. You had to buy <laughs> stock in Berkshire Hathaway. So I bought two or three stairs, shares. It was $5,000. It's only 200 now. Anyway, uh, so I start going to the meetings. Well, he is a people guy. It's so obvious the way he talks about his presidents. And, and so the time came because of this landlord fear. And I was getting lazy. I wasn't doing the job, I felt. But I felt I saw some of the future. And so I'm going to these meetings. Incredible. And if anybody wants a ticket, if you contact me, April 1, I will try to get you a ticket. It's, it's a... It's incredible experience. Uh, he and his uh, vice chairman, Charlie Munger, it's a show. It's not going to last forever. They're both in their 80s. Anyway, uh, so this is the dream. And we went to Wall Street, these guys that, you know, we didn't know it then. They should have all been in jail. But, you know, we're talking to these fancy companies with these big names. So we make a deal. I think it was Morgan Stanley. and But we put in the contract, if it's Berkshire, no commission. Well, of course, they put expenses. Well, they bring all their grandchildren to the meetings. They charge you for their grandchildren. 
their children, you know, the meeting, you need two people, but of course I'm too dumb, I don't understand what, anyway, uh, so anyway, I'm in New York right after a Berkshire meeting by the Plaza Hotel, if anybody knows where that is, uh, and I hear a lady call out, Warren Buffett, I see her talk, and the meetings were small then, and I walked over and I said, you know, I'm Barnett Hellsberg. We fit your criteria, which, you know, they put it every year. Of course, obviously, today, you know, they're just looking for billion-dollar deals. By the way, that was a rumor. Somebody told me that we got a billion. I love that rumor. It wasn't <laughs> quite true. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, well, he says, send me the information. Well, I won't give you all the Mickey Mouse because I didn't, and I did. Then he called me, he sent a letter, gave us a nice offer. I still met, but anyway, we finally did it. But I'll tell you about that guy, he's very unusual. So I introduced him to a friend of mine. I, I said, you know, I'm not knocking anybody. This is the only other jewelry company I could recommend. It's called Benbridge Jewelers, Seattle. And uh, their lawyer, said, and oh, so the, here's the deal. They come in, no due diligence. I said, well, you want to non-compete, right? Well, he says, you'll never do anything to hurt this company. So he gets a lifetime deal instead of five years. And then I said, well, uh, what about due diligence? You know, we were all set up that every piece of paper created in the last hundred years is in a room and we didn't, we even backed out one person. We, nobody came and did, we didn't allow it. Uh, and so he says, I can smell these things. This one smells good. Well, he's smart enough to know that if you have to do some of that, and you're not honesty. So anyway, that's how it happened. It was very simple. And what the lawyer told my friends who sold out, that every deal he looks for, like seven things, they were all in Buffett's attorney's work. He doesn't play gotcha. He doesn't try to trap you and see if, oh, if you didn't think of it, it's not in there. So anyway, very unusual man. So. Mr. Helsberg, on behalf of the Block School and the Rainier Institute, I think everybody here, thank you so much for joining thank us you. today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.